Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international studies, produced under the auspices of the International Studies Association and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Associate Provost and Professor of Global Politics at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with a thoughtful and engaged teacher of international studies. The goal is to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by exploring the relationships we develop with the humans who come to us seeking knowledge of global politics. On the surface, professing requires little more than knowing stuff and conveying it to others. The more we dig into the dynamics of doing that well, however, the clearer it is that teaching well requires that we understand both how students experience their worlds and how each of us experiences our own. Today's conversation is with Dr. Anahita Arian, postdoctoral research associate at the Center for Geopolitics and a college research associate at King's College, Cambridge in the UK. Among other research positions in Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East, Anahita has also taught international relations at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and at the University of Erfurt in Germany. Our conversation explores how teaching theoretical pluriversality requires significantly different approaches than teaching a focused canon. The importance of teaching students how to wrestle with the emotions that studying global politics can evoke, and pedagogical tactics for improving that emotional intelligence in three overlapping phases. Dr. Anahita Arian, thank you very much for joining on the teaching curve. We're so happy to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Happy to be here. Um, and I know we have quite a bit to talk about, but I always start these things off by asking you to position yourself. Um, so that all the members of the audience can think a little bit about how what you're saying applies to them and where you're coming from. So tell us a little bit about where you are right now. So I'm currently at the University of Cambridge, where I work as a postdoctoral research associate at the Center for Geopolitics. Um, and it's and Cambridge is a very, very different university and institution from the ones that I've been before for various reasons that I'm happy to elaborate on, but it also means that teaching in this institution is quite different than in, in other universities, from my experience. Limited. So, of course, this is a, we're, the audience is tuning in to hear about what you have to say about teaching. And, and if I know from having read a chapter that you wrote for the handbook on the pedagogy of IR theory, that, uh, that you've got these experiences at other universities in Europe and we're and I'm, I'm interested in you talking about those places primarily from the perspective of the students who were the students that you were teaching at those institutions and how would you describe them I guess so I I worked for five years at the Department of International Relations at the University of Groningen and in those years it was still a predominantly um Dutch majority student university which is obviously logical because it's in the Netherlands so so it was it was I would say overtly quite a homogenous group of students that I was teaching uh, from middle class Dutch background and the Netherlands is a multicultural society but when I was teaching I didn't have that many students with an ethnic minority background who were also Dutch so the overwhelming majority would be basically um, white uh, Dutch students. Mm. Uh, and and I think while in the Netherlands, people are very open and, and think of themselves as very tolerant, um, and when teaching theories of international relations, and particularly when it came to post-colonial theory, against the backdrop, uh, backdrop, uh, backdrop of all kinds of political debates that were ongoing in that period of time mm. um, in the Netherlands, it was quite a different experience for me because um, there was a lot of resistance against it and you would be broaching topics like racism and for a really, really long time in the Netherlands, this idea uh, prevailed that everybody's colorblind and, and there is no racism. So there was a complete denial that, that racism would exist mm. um, and people would be extremely offended if you just would raise that issue or question and kind of like push it out of hand. And so against that background, teaching a group of students um, in which it, in a society where there is racial amnesia, colonial aphasia, so, mm. so completely denying the existence and not mentioning it, not educating it, 
um, it's very difficult because their perception of, uh, of the identity of the Netherlands fundamentally is being altered or, or, or they confronted with a particular past that they're not ready to, to accept or to see. So I think that in itself, apart from my own way of presenting it, the course content itself was yeah. difficult to, right. to deal with for them. Um, so, and then I'm also a woman uh, and also a woman with a minority background. So, and as various um, studies have shown, uh, students react very different to women, um, particularly with a minority background, uh, yeah. and to white male uh, professors. So, and and that division was also there. So, it was a double whammy, so to say, for me. There were, on right. one hand, obviously the course content, and on the other hand, my my physical presence in that classroom also ignited all kinds of emotions because they thought, oh, she must agree with them, you know, <laughs> yeah. because she may not completely identify as. Uh, comprehensively as a Dutch person and she probably understands her. So maybe she's not loyal. So yeah. it was a very um, tricky period to teach this course. Here particularly, not the course itself, because everybody, you know, young students, their second year undergrad students, they love classical realism. <laughs> I mean, all of them think, oh yes, it, it's true, it's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when, it, when you try to actually show that well there are different ways of looking at the world then naturally start, sometimes resistance creeps in when it came to the post-colonial part it was it was so unsettling that you you would have a very emotional reaction to it from, from mm. a lot of people. and i also saw this sometimes with feminist theory particularly when it when it wasn't liberal feminist but but and for my male students in particular <laughs> yeah what's your goal for that teaching them post-colonial theory um just both professionally and personally what are you trying to get them i get out of them for that well at that particular point in time i don't think i was so consciously um thinking about that i thought this is a theory course i have to teach and the most important thing is, is that they understand the theories that mm -hmm. they show that they have a capacity to think in abstract terms that they show they have a capacity to be analytical, to be critical, to be reflexive, and, and to see things from different perspectives, to see what the pros and cons are, that you're good in constructing arguments. So I basically worked within the parameters that were set. And I think the reason why it was also, well, I, it was just a novice lecturer. I was still trying to discover my own style and, and it, and that process was itself uh, characterized by <laughs> falling and, you know, stepping up again, learning, or, hey, this student reacts in that particular way, that student reacts in that particular way. This one has difficulties with abstract thinking. Uh, this one is very good at abstracting. So just trying to understand if also the group dynamic uh, within a classroom. Uh, teaching is a very complicated thing it's not that easy it looks easy but it's not <laughs> there's i so agree with you involved. and when you're not that experienced you're mostly reactive <laughs> and you, yeah. you're not yet um well experienced to take control over, over the classroom and and i think uh or to make sure that you move into the directions that you want the, uh, the classroom to move into and I think it took me really some time before I was really capable uh, of, of doing that uh, and, and knowing what I wanted, what I wanted to avoid and how to do it and how to bring students with you. And actually yeah. all of these things happened <laughs> once I was at the University of Airport. Yes. Um, so, th so there's a switch and it's a very different kind of student body. Tell me about the students there. So the University of Airport is actually very small. So it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, it, but it's very vibrant. So and it's in the former East Germany. So there's a lot going on there as well because you have students that come from from the particular area. A lot of them do, but you have also students coming from the former West Germany. And then uh, in this uh, in those two years that I was teaching in that cohort, there were a lot of international students. And um, as you're trying to then approach post-colonial theory in that context, what kind of different 
methods, tactics? I mean, you have different resources in the room if you've got that. How, how did that expand your teaching of that topic? Uh, tremendously, because when I was there, I also was um, free to design my own courses. So I immediately uh, decided not to teach any IR canon theory <laughs> and just solely focus on, on theories from various parts of the global south. Um, and for me, the reason to do so was, well, first of all, they had IR theory and canon theory, the students in airport that were full-time enrolled as a mandatory course. So yeah. they already knew it. Uh, but most importantly, I thought that, and I still think that within within our field, um, uh, there is a lot of pluriversality and we have moved on from, from Eurocentric theories. We are exploring all kinds of other concepts intellectually, so to say, and there is a rich uh, literature out there, but it just doesn't seem to translate into the classroom. So for me, an objective was translating this disciplinary pluriversality into the classroom itself. And at the same time, uh, also the fact that the world is changing as we're moving into further into the 21st century, students will continue to need to negotiate differences. We all do all the time because you have the internationalization of labor, but also education, obviously. Yeah. And just more generally globalization itself. So you're constantly encountering different uh, perspectives and understandings. And so for me, part of it is not only translating uh, what is happening in the discipline from an intellectual and educational perspective, but also with an outlook to the real world out there. And these students, I think maybe 2% of them will stay in academia, but most of them will go out there and in that world and they will continuously encounter different ways of thinking and perspectives. And they need to be capacitated to engage with that in a constructive manner, to, to listen to it, to try to understand it, to be empathetic towards it instead of being dismissive or moving it out of hand, like, well, that doesn't matter because I don't think that's the re really productive way of engaging with it. Yeah, but, uh, but what you're talking about there is basically teaching them an attitude. And you know what I mean? It's not so much the nuts and bolts and the here are the five points about this that you need to know. It's more of an approach or an attitude. How do you, how did you go about doing that? The way I went about it is basically construct a course that would try to move into that and understand how international relations is experienced from different parts of the world. So I constructed the course and, uh, and, basically structured it in three parts. The first part, basically the critique, uh, the, by now it's so repeated that we all know Eurocentrism in IR and, uh, and how it basically, um, as a result of that, avoids questioning how other people experience or theorize it. Moving on then to the potentials and limits of, uh, of the development or the exploration of theories and concepts from the global south to finally the exploration of those concepts and theories itself, exposing students to difference um, and teaching them at the same time how you can uh, engage with difference and not in a way that is ego-based mm -hmm. or that you move into defending your own uh, background or identity or political system or culture, but in a way that is open that is that is about curiosity that it's about reflexivity it's about understanding you don't need to agree with it all the time but you need to be open to it and listen to it and try to understand so it developed from these these ideas and combined with the experience of, of the anger and anxiety mm -hmm. that 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 students grappled with when they they were unsettled and you still see that that's when students get unsettled and they inevitably will get unsettled because that is what university education is about. It's not about that we cuddle you and make you feel very, very comfortable. No, it is about you learning to live with uncertainty, doubt, and uncomfortableness mm -hmm. and, and how to sit in that realm uh, without panicking, without disengaging, without rejecting, without becoming angry. Yeah. But 
actually embracing it. Um, and I realized on the road that the only way for me to achieve this is not only to do that um, on a cognitive competency level, then in, in the sense of training their skills of uh, processing, um, uh, analyzing knowledge, uh, understanding it, applying it, evaluating it. And then those skills are very important. And we yeah. focus all of our courses in IR or in any of most disciplines are oriented towards that, but that it would only be through effective competency. And the reason why is that these are very young people. Their emotional intelligence is still in a stage of development. Yep. And we tend to ignore that when we're teaching. And the classroom is actually a very emotional space because they're reacting emotionally to, to, to the content of the course material. And when I think back about when I was a student, I was very emotionally detached from the content. Um, so I just, in a very cognitive way and mm -hmm. very intellectual way, I engaged with it. Now, I don't want to say whether that's good or bad, but we're dealing with a very different generation. <laughs> that it's very not similar to my generation. And that reality basically, um, forced me to consider how to go about it. How do I get students so far to just embrace this concept of academic freedom because it, and also therefore dealing with things that make you uncomfortable mm -hmm. without them basically becoming um, angry or, or, or uh, resisting it uh, or avoiding it or disengaging with it because yeah. I really want to break through that shell of yours your walls and bring all of them down and the only way i realized was actually their effective competences that that needs to be next to the cognitive one that needs to be further nurtured because once their emotional intelligence starts to be uh develops further they are more uh enabled to actually embrace those principles of yeah. academic freedom dealing with discomfort, dealing with um, things that are difficult or unsettling. Uh, and so that's when I thought, okay, I think the key to this is empathy in a very uh, convoluted way. Because when I spoke to some people, they, 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 the immediate reaction to this is when I just tell about it and they haven't read the chapter or they haven't, uh, and I have not been elaborate enough or in detail. Like, but aren't you then basically um, indulging the 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 this particular generation mm. needs for safety and all kinds of safety? And I tell them, no. <laughs> what I'm trying to do <laughs> is through, even if it's so counterintuitive, yeah, through this method, <laughs> preparing them for uh, for embracing that discomfort. It's very interesting because you have a whole class, some of whom are in one place with respect to this and some in, in another. What kind of stuff did you do to help everybody move forward? Um, well, I mean, through the, even if the students that are intuitively empathetic to difference, they're not necessarily conscious about what it brings them. So right. the, in their case, a level of consciousness is raised uh, uh, for them to understand also how they are relating to other people. So there is always a gain also for them. Uh, whereas for the others that, that are not necessarily, uh, a priori dismissive, but still like uncomfortable or that it evokes certain reactions that they find it difficult. I think it's, it, it's a very explicit way and explicate way of making them understand what it is that they're feeling. Why are you feeling this? Mm -hmm. um, uh, how are you, what, what are you going to do with it? Uh, so it confirms, it confronts them in a very direct way with their own emotions. So that is basically also, whereas subconscious is taking subconsciously place, but you're trying to explicate it yeah. uh, and ask them to, so, and what are you going to do about it? So are you going to regulate it? it? Does it make sense what you're feeling? Um, what is the deeper underlying reasons that you're feeling it? And for me, way of going about it was 
as I explained in a chapter, I mean, the very processual way is that when you're when they're reading the text, they obviously have to analyze the text and engage with it uh, from a, a cognitive intellectual perspective. So training those cognitive skills. Um, but at the same time, I would also ask them to think about, well, not think, but also what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And and some would be very euphoric and happy <laughs> because there was a different way of looking at things uh, and they were very excited about it. And others, it made them uncomfortable um, or they, they, they were aware of certain stereotypes or they were suspicious about it. So this usually happens when it came to theories from the Muslim world <laughs> because nobody could believe that, oh, there is an element of, of, uh, of humanity in it Mm. or uh, there is an element of human rights in it or there is an element of freedom in it and and again that the reason why is that they are so conditioned by discourses um that are ongoing about about the muslim world that they have already a stereotype in mind and actually have the tendency to just dismiss it out of hands that well whatever this person is saying it can't be true or mm. it's just not true or it's a lie or it's propaganda Right. What I try to do all across the board is to make them engage in a way in which they would also completely decenter themselves. So when we had that process is first, okay, you engage with the text, you're the center stage as the person that is engaging with the text. So what are you thinking? What are the arguments? Are they weak? Are they strong? Why? Explain. What are you feeling? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Are you convinced? Are you happy? Are you excited? Are you curious? Mm -hmm. And again, you know, narrate that. So explicate what, what it is that you're feeling. How are you going to engage with that? How are you going to move forward with it? And then the second stage, basically, the engagement was one of completely decentering yourself. So moving away from who you are, what you know, and engaging with the text and students in class in a very very open way and really trying to you know uh, move away from crawling back into your own safe little world that you know from where you sit and see things yeah um, and in that space of of being so decentered and uh and and it's a blank space basically um they were able to listen uh intently and deeply so without rehearsing their own arguments in their minds of what I'm about to say now or without the listening was then not ego based. It was not about mm -hmm. being, being right or wrong. It was really about listen intently and engage or ask questions in a respectful manner. And following that process itself, I think it was so um, profound for many of them um, and they can then later, I would ask them to go back and again, recenter themselves yeah. and think about what they had learned through that engagement in which they basically transcended, quote unquote, the self, not, in, not entirely, but to great measure that made it possible to, to listen very deeply uh, and, and engage and to feel empathy or understanding um, for, for a particular perspective or concept or way of experiencing international relations. So was this in writing or this was in a, like a seminar discussion format? What were the practicalities of where were their bodies in this process while they were going through that? So the first phase of, of reading and in which the self is the center stage is it's a very um, personal or it, it's on the student itself. If they want to take notes, they can, uh, they can, they can put it in writing if they, uh, and most did. So they would always take some notes because they would also have to discuss the theory and also the parts. Sometimes you disagree with things, not because the logic is absent, but it's, it's an emotional thing. So, so that engagement basically forces them to answer it. Is it, am I disagreeing because the mm. evidence is not there or am I disagreeing because I feel not good about it? Right. So, uh, so it forced them so one way or another, when they would say, I, uh, if, if they're, analysis of the text was sound in the sense of saying like, yeah, for these and these 
argumentative reasons that that argument that the author is making or, or um, this presentation of, uh, of, of uh, data or sources um, is not complete. So it, the argument itself is to a certain extent um, weak, then, then you could, okay, okay, so this is all very analytical, critical, very much on the cognitive level, but sometimes you would also notice as, as, as the lecturer that it, it's, it's not the cognitive thing. There's something brewing under there and you're yeah. pushing of someone to just get it out. What is it that, what is it that it's triggering you uh, and why it makes you disagree? And um, I think, so that, that part was individualized in a way, but it would come back in the classroom because in the classroom, Parallel to decentering, other persons were centered because they were right. talking. Yes. So, so you would constantly change hats as a student. So in one moment, you were completely in a listening mode, very much engaging with what somebody else was saying or explaining. Uh, and, and in the next moment, you might be the person that was doing the talking. So, and through all kinds of activities, we, we basically covered that. Some of them were uh, small group discussions that students just engage with each other. Others were a class-based storytelling um, or, or doing certain assignments. So there was, so every time there, there was a different way of doing things and I kept uh, changing it so that they would never <laughs> get too much eased in. Uh, yeah. Um, it's a constantly going back and forth and, ch and changing things and they appreciated it. They liked it. It keep and kept things fresh. And so that was very much based in the seminar activity, the second phase. And then the third phase, it was also in a seminar because we would also discuss it. Like how has it changed for you? This, uh, this engagement with this different, how, how do you, what do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Has it changed your way of seeing things? Has it changed your way of of, of the stereotypes you may have had of that part of the world uh, or that part of the world that you have been accustomed to see as a potential threat to your own existence because of the ongoing political discourses and all the noise in the background in which you're basically being conditioned in, in terms of the society. So, so they were just overlapping between an internal engagement for students the explication of it and interaction with other students, taking notes when you're reading the text, taking notes when you're actually at the, uh, at the seminar. So I didn't uh, force them to, to be very, um, as in terms of note taking, that you need to always take notes and you need to show that to me. So it was very much, uh, is however you want to think or you want to engage with it, it's fine with me. And, and I think, that part was also really appreciated because there was there was no pressure or force to to comply mm -hmm. with one form of, of expressing yourself or or a requirement that you have to write down this or that so it was really up to the students and by taking away that force of you have to write it down they could enter more freely and openly into into the discussions or just like take the stance of the listener without feeling like, oh, I have to perform now multiple tasks at the same time, I have to listen and write. Because when you have to do both things and take notes in a seminar when somebody else is talking, then you're distracted. You're yeah, really of course. Uh, Anahita, I, I think this is really very indicative of something you hear people say a lot, but there's not necessarily a lot of practicalities for how it shows up in pedagogy. And that is we want to treat students as whole persons. We want to see them in all their dimensions as much as possible. And, and I, I really appreciate how the structures of what you're talking about allow that, them to bring themselves into the classroom and to be the experiencers of what is the stuff we study, global politics, and how we think about that. So uh, I, this is terrific. I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. So happy to share. <laughs> The Teaching Curve podcast is made available in video and audio only versions at the Professional Resource Center of the International Studies Association. Audio versions can be found on all major podcast platforms. You can send feedback or suggestions for future interviews to teachingcurve at isonet.org. And follow us on X at teachingcurve.
Thanks very much for joining us again on The Teaching Curve. And remember, learn something every time you teach.